Sambad at Arunim Ankuran. On the occasion of World Wildlife Day, 3rd of March, we are in conversation with Mr. Anirudh Chauji. Uh, he's the director of Ran Mangli Foundation and a wildlife enthusiast. It's a great pleasure and privilege to have him with us today. The future of wildlife rests in our hands. We are going to talk to him about his tremendous contribution to preservation of wildlife in this country. A word about Aruni Mankuran. This is an initiative for positive social change through self-development. The goal is greater well-being and happiness for all. At Aruni Mankuran, we believe that each person is unique and special in some way, that each person can make a difference, that each person can make a contribution, and that's what keeps driving us every day. So we don't own the planet Earth. We belong to it and we must share it with our wildlife. Many of us talk about wildlife. We want to do things also about trying to preserve it, but we don't really always know what to do. So we have a guest on our show today. Uh, he's the author of Wild by Nature. Uh, he's training forest neighboring local communities to generate livelihoods. He's improving ecotourism experiences in Maharashtra forests and making a difference for a cleaner environment. So thank you so much for joining us and welcome to Ek Samvad. Pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much. Man. So before we go any further, aapko wildlife mein interest kahan se generate hua and what was the inspiration? I come from a Fauji family. My father was from the armed forces. And Air Force stations have always been outside the city limits. So I'm talking of 70s, early 70s, my formative years. And even if we just went out for an evening walk, we would see probably small Indian foxes or black nipped hares, as we call them, rabbits. All of them jumping around. Uh, the air would be fresh. There would be lots of trees around. The, the, those are the kind of things that we grew up with. And then I remember when my father was posted in Nagpur in those days, mm -hmm. any long weekend would mean that we would be in Tutlado, Ranido, Navegao, Nagzira, mm, these kind of forests. So I think it was in the genes. Mm -hmm. um, took uh, my career, uh, I started with um, hardcore marketing, HCL and Modi Xerox. Hmm. Uh, but I think uh, I was not meant for those kind of jobs. Hmm. So earlier we formed something called as Bhumata, ran for about four or five years. Hmm. And from Bhumata in the year 99, we formed Pagmax. And after 18 years of uh, running Pagmax, um, I took an early retirement in the year, uh, in my 49th year of life, retired and then joined the forest department. Worked at Melghat for one year and then Taroba for three years. So that's been a short journey. Wow. Tell us a little about Pug Marks. The name itself is so enticing, you know. The, the image that comes to mind is uh, a beautiful one. Those were the early days. Today, I mean, if you open Facebook or any, any uh, social media, you, you see so many people who are taking you to faraway, pristine areas. So, you know, in the 94, 95, when we started Bhumata and the WWF, you all came from the WWF background. Mm -hmm. So WWF is Worldwide Fund for Nature. And then, of course, Bhumata and then eventually Pagmaks in the early years, it was still convincing parents ki I'm going to take your kid and bring him back safely. Mm -hmm. And in between, show him probably tigers or make him jump from a cliff or, you know, mm -hmm. do rafting. And there would always be that fear factor amongst the parents. Is it safe? Do you think you should be doing this? Today, you know, um, in the later years of Pagmaks, um, maybe 2010 onwards, I saw a complete difference. Um, I'm myself a skydiver, a scuba diver, whitewater rafter, trekker. Um, but after 2010 and beyond, I saw parents so a little more experimenting. And we had so many kids diving with us in Lakshadweep, in Andamans, 
or coming with me to Spain to jump off, to jump out of an aircraft mm-hmm. uh, from about twelve to fifteen thousand feet. Early days were difficult, but mm-hmm. yeah. Now today, you it's such a pleasure to see the new generation of kids. Of course, minus the COVID period, but um, people are exploring. And my father had always told me the story of a person called Lord Clive. Lord Clive, as we you know, is the first governor general. Mm-hmm. But his history was at the age of 18, he was kicked out of his house in England, mm-hmm. boarded a ship, went to Brazil, and then eventually came to India. Mm-hmm. Imagine, can any 18 years old in India go off on his own, take a ship, and you know, when out of the 10 ships, three or four would sink in those days? Mm-hmm. That is the kind of upbringing that the British children had. And no wonder they ruled the planet. Mm, British and the other Europeans also. So what we saw was an Indian child grew up in an atmosphere, Gabbar ka dialogue, you know, bache, to gabbar a jayega. So udar ja, uh, jamat bache, udar to bhoot hai, udar to bagul hai, udar to chor hai, daku hai. So, you know, that's how we controlled our kids, unfortunately. So by the time the kid grew up, he always grew up under confidence. Most of the times, the parents would take all the decisions for him. So the kid couldn't even take decisions on his own. So many of the volunteers who came to Pagmarks came as raw little kids at the age of about 16, 17 years of life. If they had 2,000 rupees in their pockets, the parents would call, there's money in the pocket, take care. Hmm. When they led a Pagmark camp, forget to Manali, I'm talking Mathiran from Pune. 200, 100 kilometers from Pune. They would carry with them about 1.5 lakhs. Or if they travel to Manali on a train in a sleeper class, then I'm talking those days, mm-hmm. with about a lakh of rupees in their bag, they would hold on to the bag and sleep like this. Mm-hmm. Seven days they would lose their sleep. But when they came back, they would come, come back totally changed. Because that sense of responsibility adds years to your life. Which unfortunately in the Indian families, little difficulty. Even now I see many kids stay. So what Pagmarks did, we were never a tour and travel company. Hmm. We were a leadership building company. And we built young leaders, youth leaders. Today we have like um, WCS Bangalore. Uh, it's on par with you know Wildlife Institute of India. Hmm. So WCS Bangalore for five years, or well, five batches, alternate years. When their total intake is 12 students for their MSc biology, biology course, out of the 12 students, for five consecutive years, we had at least one, sometimes even two, mm-hmm. Pagmarkers on their you know, courses. Mm-hmm. Same, I mean, today you have Pagmarkers in the best of the institutions in the US, UK, Australia, India, in many of these institutions. So what we try to do is, we try to tell them, very simple. This is nature. You come with me. I'm sure you'll fall in love with it. Yes. What you want to do with it is your choice. You can be a wildlife. You can be an adventurer. You can be a bird watcher. I'm not even saying that. There were kids whom I told who could not continue to pursue their engineering. It was going difficult. I told them, leave it. Hmm. But then whatever you want to do, be the best. In. So I've had uh, volunteers shifting to football. They're football coaches. Mm-hmm. And today they're among the finest football coaches. The unfortunate part is, you know, engineering, medicine, bus, it may karo. So today we have some of the finest wildlife biologists from Pagmaks. Mm. There is this girl called Pallavi who works with Wildlife Institute of India. She has radio collared. She's been in the radio coloring team. Mm-hmm. Of, I think some eight to 10 tigers and four wild dogs. Mm. I mean, this is the kind of work that these pugmarkers, I'm not saying pugmarkers, I'm saying if you give your child the liberty and the opportunity to work on field, wildlife offers lots of options. Mm. When I say it, adventure also, mm. you know, there are a lot of people who thought that wildlife and adventure are two different watertight compartments. At Pagmarks, we realize that an adventurer sees more wildlife and a wildlifer 
has to do a lot of adventure to get to his area to see the world. So mm -hmm. it's a beautiful mix. You need to, you know, climb up trees, rappel down rock faces, mm -hmm. as a wildlife. Yeah. And as an adventurer, you end up seeing leopards and god forsaken places where you don't know where to run from there. You mm -hmm. don't need to run. Leopards don't do anything to you. Oh, I but like that. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of life that wildlifers live. This is the kind of life that adventurers live. And fortunately, a lot, a lot of pugmarkers are living this life. And that is what Pagmarks is all about. Wonderful. So when you're saying a Pagmark expedition, can you describe us in detail, you know, how exactly it would be like from boarding till coming back? What are some of the things that the kids would experience and how it would impact? See, Pagmarks basically worked with kids. So till about 24, mm -hmm. I mean, eight years to 24 years, this was the bandwidth that we had. Um, interestingly, many a times, the campers, as you would call them, who came along with us. Campers would be about 18, 19 years, 20 years, and their volunteer in charge would be about 16, 17 years. Mm -hmm. But the leader who could, I'm not saying control as in control, but who would be able to mobilize, would be able to inspire the whole group of 35 to do a task together. It would start, you know, meeting the parents in Pune after they had signed up. You would have a pre-camp get together. Mm -hmm. That is where all the doubts and the fears of the parents would come up. I mean, very logical. I yes. agree with that. But that is the time we had to tell them, ki, yes, these things are taken care. But then that's also the time I used to tell them, whenever this kid calls up home from that camp, and he wants to tell you about his experience of seeing the tiger next to him, leopard on the tree, and maybe a swath bear and a tiger fighting. And you are asking him, Naya kya, brush kya kya, dhoya kya, khaya kya. Are, he is so excited. He wants to tell you that he's been in the snow for the first time in his life to about 14,000 feet altitude. He's had a bath in cold water in the lake over there in Brugu Lake. Mm -hmm. These are kind of things that he wants to tell you from there, or the girl wants to tell you from there. Mm -hmm. And you want to ask him, brush kya kya, mm -hmm. kya. So I said, listen to him and listen to her and also once they come back for one month listen to their stories because it's going to be such an exciting life for them that they would have experienced in that short eight to ten days that they were with us so anyways we would travel um early days we used to travel in trains in, uh, in the sleeper class mm -hmm. then of course we shifted to the air conditioned uh, class and then uh, lately, most of the camps now travel by flights. You save a lot on time also. Uh, and the flights are much more economical than reasonable. Once you reach the campsite, wherever it could be in luxury down south, it could be the Andamans, it could be somewhere in Spain, it could be in Malaysia, or it could be in Ladakh. Wherever you reach the first day, is a shock because you've never been in such a place. So it's a culture shock. It's a place, oh my God, where am I? Kind of, and oh my God, where am I? Also, you get overawed by the whole thing. Second onwards, they're a little more mellowed down and they start listening. So this is where our activities would begin. We have a campsite in, um, you know, very close to Dehradun at Mukteshwar. The first day, the first activity is treasure hunt. But this treasure hunt is very different. We send the kids with all the treasure hunt clues into the neighboring village where they have to go and meet people by names, search for them in the village, meet mm. them, mm. interact with them, and then go and find the clue. On day five or day six, you go into the village again and you work in a family's home in the village. And that's how you earn your lunch with the same family. So you work with your family. It could be working in the cow shed or it could be working anywhere else in the field. Mm -hmm. But you work to get paid in terms in the form of a lunch. And then on the, the next day, you do some social service like building a bridge, building a bund, those kind of things. And mind you, you know, in today's families, 
पेरेंट्स को भी आगाज कर ओ माय गॉड मेरे बच्चे ने बर्तन धोए ऐसे कैसे हो सकता है हमारे पास तो चार चार भाई हैं बट दैट लर्निंग दैट दे गेट ओवर देयर मेड दिस क्लाउड नाइन कैंप मोस्ट पॉपुलर कैंप इन द पगमार्क्स सो इन ऑल प्लेसेस वी ट्राई टू इंश्योर दैट इफ यू वेंट इनटू अ विलेज वी वुड पेंट अ कपल ऑफ क्लासरूम्स along with the local kids we would play games along with the local kids there would be a football match there would be a volleyball match with the locals hmm. so and parmarks again brought you know a little more interaction with the reality so the catch line for parmarks is discover your planet but discover yourself yes so where you discover yourself because you've been insulated you know you've stayed in the same class creed religion the community it's a very ghettoed growth that most of the indian children have nowadays but when they go out on such programs they the co camper could be from any other caste creed color religion mm-hmm. but when they go to the village and they interact with the locals over there it's an amazing eye opener so that is something that so you know uh running pagmarks paisa to aane hi hai you do any work and do a dedication paisa aata hai but the real earning for me personally and of course my partners was when my friends their kids went out on pagmarks camp and they would come back and tell the parents dad when i grow up i want to be a pagmarks volunteer and that i said yes that is the biggest earning that we had been able to do so we could raise pagmarks to become one of the most popular wildlife and adventure um, nature camp organization mm-hmm. and between march mid and uh, june mid pagmarks used to take around 3500 to 4000 children to different parts of the country and at pagmarks we are only about 9 or 10 of us and mm-hmm. rest all were around 250 to 300 volunteers who would accompany these kids on different camps so it was more about growing up um, i was in australia met a friend um uh, in fact uh, met a volunteer and with her drove half the part of australia and other half with another pagmarker uh, we drove all the way had a car and drove to cranes to um the great barrier reef and we dived over there so those kind of things you know very few people can very frankly speaking very few people can say that this is the kind of spread that our community the pagmark community as we write uh, as we call it. we had massive um, community spread all over wow so let's uh, talk a little bit more about wildlife first of all what is wildlife and you know in your perception and uh, why does it need to be protected why is it endangered what is happening i won't go into the british times because we all know how much shikar was done by the britishers and also by the indian maharajas and you know somebody killed 100 somebody killed 200 hmm. let's forget the british times during the british times of course a uh, term was me reserved forest which we still know the major reserve forest in but very few of us actually know the meaning of the term reserve forest was forest reserved for the queen of england which means all the produce all the wood would go only to the queen of england and the native indian had no rights to enter such a forest there would be a forest guard with a danda with a bandook or whatever and if anyone entered you could be hit hammered or shot whatever 1947 when we became independent and we were india a republic we should have changed that terminology of reserve forest but probably we found it convenient to operate with the same mm-hmm. rules mm-hmm. believe me before the british came that small gap of about 150 200 years before that india has a history of 10000 plus years where people coexisted with their forests okay. they lived with their forests but during this british time the forests were stolen from the people 
and people were kept away. And unfortunately, after 1947, we did the same. We continued with the same policy. From 47 to, let's say, 72 years now, we are still faced with one problem, that our forests are diminishing, the trees are going, the animals are being poached. Why hasn't things changed? Why haven't the things changed in these 72 years? Why is it that we are still faced with the same problems of wildlife fighting for a survival? Yes. Species like great and bustard. I was in a particular park in Maharashtra mm -hmm. and I was watching a bird, the great Indian bustard, Maldo. And suddenly a guy comes next to me and says, Bird na marjana chi. I said, Kya kare? Nee, marjana chi. I said, Kyo? Abhi to amariya development aiga. And that was the biggest eye opener that I had. People who live in the forest, mm -hmm. no electricity no water, very poor roads, no medical facility, no schooling, mm -hmm. nothing. But then they are told, jungle bachao, share bachao. Is khushi mein bhai? Is khushi mein bachao? Mm -hmm. So he was all the time kept away from all this. The person living next to the forest was not supposed to have any aspirations at all. Mm -hmm. These city dwellers, we can have anything. We can Buy one mobile, throw this out, buy another mobile, you know, live the way we want. But if you're living next to the forest, you will live by the rules and help save the forest. Rubbish. It never worked. Till 2011 12, when we had an amazing uh, principal secretary forest, <laughs> Pravin Singh Pardeshi. And this man had a vision. And he had a realization that why should people save a forest which has been kept away from where he is not a stakeholder mm. that is where he <clears throat> conceived a very nice eco development committee mm. the norm so when he talked of eco development committee which would be comprised of the locals of that village and they would protect the forest people in the forest department started laughing amare to kitni committee a joint forest management ye wo kuch nahi hua he said, no, it's my money. So the forest department again said, Sir, we don't have money for salaries. Where do you have money for salaries? He said, you won't pay. And the government of Maharashtra won't pay. Tourism will pay. And they started laughing. Where will tourism pay for tourism? So he said, tourism, safaris? They said, ah, we are already... I'll give you the example of Tadu. Tadu was running um, safaris from six gates. These are the core areas. So when Pardeshi Zab said ki we'll do safaris, they all started laughing. So Pardeshi Zab said, okay, uh, we'll do safaris in Buffer. They started laughing louder. Why will anyone go to Buffer? So I said, are you sure you're not interested in Buffer? They said, no, we are not interested. In Buffer. So I said, let us give the Buffer to the villages. That is how Agarzari in Tadova became the first village to run its own safari. Initial days are very difficult. They have to stop the vehicles. Rukjau, Rukjau, sir, we have to safari chalti hai. And people would say, nee, nee, we are going to Kor. Tomorrow, buffer is falling. Today, the situation is such that Agarzari, Devada, or Adigao, Dunona, these do more business and this growth has been because we trusted the locals. We trusted them to run the ecotourism. And most important, today we have six core gates. Mm. And unbelievable that it might sound, we have 15 buffer gates. 14 for safaris, one for night safari special. Mm. 21 gates that Taroba has. You go to Kana, Bandhavga, Rantamur, Kaziranga, you go anywhere. You have two, three or four gates. Hmm. Tadova has 21 gates. 21 gates plus six amazing activities. Well, I'm sorry, 12 amazing activities. Hmm. Which means almost 30 to 35 villages around Tadova are directly benefit, benefiting from tourism. 
Hmm. And which means today people realize that if they did not look after their forest, if the animals like tigers died, or if the forest vanished, tourism would vanish, their money that was coming would go away. Mm -hmm. Everyone today is a stakeholder mm -hmm. and wants to commit their lives to protecting the world. It's an amazing model. And I keep talking at different um, you know, platforms. One of them in China, I'm a part of International Association, Association for Protected Areas. One of the African parks, a park director is a very close friend of mine. Invariably, our presentations used to be the his first or mine first. Mm -hmm. He used to always make presentations. So many poachers neutralized, shut down. So many guns confiscated. So many vehicles confiscated. In a country called you know, uh, South Africa and their neighboring countries. That's where all these poachers used to come. And immediately my presentation would be so many eco-development committees established, so many women getting uh, livelihoods, so many men getting livelihoods. On the third year, he presented before me and it brought tears to my eyes. He said, we established three eco-development committees in Botswana and the poaching has reduced so much and blah, 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 blah. I said, what Kana, Bandavgar, Ransambore did not learn, South African Park learned it from Tadu. Now I'll tell you, uh, as far as MP is concerned, MP is a, a state with the finest tourism, wildlife tourism. Let's not call it ecotourism. It's wildlife tourism. Ecotourism is when community benefits. In Karnataka, entire tourism, wildlife tourism is run by jungle lodges and resorts. There's no community in it. So there's no eco in it. It is only jungle and wildlife community. So let's not confuse these terms, though people like to say we are doing ecotourism, rubbish. Just by education, you cannot do ecotourism. Ecotourism means that the local community has to be a stakeholder, has to be a beneficiary, and then alone can you call this tourism ecotourism. So believe me when I tell you the MP forest minister, MP head of forest force, MP PCCFs, and the park directors of the MP forest, come to Taduba to understand how ecotourism works in Taduba. So what I'm trying to tell you is wildlife is at crossroads. But if you're going to use a gun to protect wildlife, saying that anyone who comes down will be shot, mm -hmm. trespassers will be shot down, this is book. India-Pakistan border with not just small, small arms, they have AK-47, AK-56, Bofors and God knows what all weapons, but so many people, infiltrators keep coming in. And forest guard is a danda, what will he stop the poacher? Only solution is when the local villagers spot a new element walking in and then question him, Kaan se ayo? Ka, ke, ka, ke le ayo? and realize that he is a poacher and then hand him over to the forest department or shoo him off. So when you have friendly neighbors, you don't need guns. So that is what Taruba has shown. Beautiful. None of our officers carry guns. And from 2012, when we had 25 tigers in Taruba, we have 115 tigers as of now, plus mm -hmm. 250 leopards, approximate. 100 to 115 tigers from 25. Mm -hmm. And 250 leopards. We have huge prey bases. Somebody here, spotted deer, blue bulls, wild boars, in a very plentiful condition. The habitat has improved, water bodies have improved, grasslands have improved, but more important, our partnerships with the local community has been phenomenal. They are our protectors. They are our stakeholders. So when a tiger walks around amongst these Remember, it is 1.5 lakh population in almost 80 villages, which are a part of the buffer. Mm -hmm. It is not a small population. Yes. So the probability of conflict is very high. Yes. Our problem is, Tiger, when it's moving around these villages, we are very happy. We are still comfortable. Mm -hmm. The moment it leaves these villages and goes outside the buffer, mm -hmm. that is where 
we are not very confident. You know, but inside the buffer area, the tiger is safe. And I think this is what, uh, so coming down to our uh, World Wildlife Day, you know, 1973, the CITES signatures, the signatories to CITES agreement mm -hmm. came together. And that is where, you know, this World Wildlife Day came, came into being. Um, not to be confused with our Wildlife Week, which is in October. Mm -hmm. So that's in India. But as far as uh, this thing is concerned, Wildlife Day is international. Mm -hmm. So CITES is fighting a losing battle worldwide for trying to protect species from human pressure. One is, the more important is the habitat destruction, mm -hmm. you know, which is very important. Yes. Because as the human population grows, and nobody talks about the human population growing, I don't know why, but as the human population grows, the demand for food and the demand for cultivable lands increases. True. And this brings into conflict people and the forest. Mm -hmm. People and trees and people and the beautiful people who live, live amongst the trees. Mm -hmm. the yes. So what happens is the battle that CITES and of course all the internationally all the countries are fighting is you know it's difficult to stop the growth of population at this stage. What happened is our life longevity of our lives has increased because of the medicines. Hmm. But the number of people have not reduced. Mm -hmm. Or the people number is continuously increasing, if I may put it more politically correct. So this planet can only sustain certain number of people. Mm -hmm. And this is where the problem is. So if people live or forest, it can't be both together. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is what is being seen. So as a part of this, World Wildlife Day, all over the world, we are trying to increase that sensitivity amongst people for wildlife. The unfortunate part is, I would have loved the media to play a slightly more, you know, more important role. Sometimes, sometimes, I'm saying sometimes, the media can also play a very negative role. A leopard comes into the village and somebody is injured. Hmm. Hmm. Instigating people. So this is not done. Hmm. You'd like people to become a little more aware of the problems faced by the wildlife. And believe me when I tell you, a leopard or a tiger, if you're walking in the forest, which I do very frequently, I will never be killed by a leopard or a leopard or a tiger in the forest. Yeah, sloth bears sometimes, you know, if you don't give it a chance and you get too close, those are creepy. But I've come about four feet from a sloth bear and I've walked away. Mm -hmm. uh, wild boar is something that I'll always fear. Mm -hmm. It's one animal I can't trust. But forget that. Mm -hmm. Walking in a forest at one o'clock at night, I'm still very comfortable. I'll have a torch, I'll have a denda, and I'll talk. So when I'm talking or singing, I'm telling the whole jungle that there's a stupid human walking in your forest, move away, make space for him. Forest, you have all beautiful people. So we need to learn a lot from them. I don't know why we should use such a derogatory term called jungle. So. They are more civilized than us. Yes, that is so true. Now that we have uh, sort of understood that, you know, the conflict comes because of the pressure of the population. Uh, so what are some of the solutions that you have thought of in terms of controlling that? And the idea of humans feeling threatened by wildlife is probably what prompts them to, you know, destroy the wildlife, so to say. So talk to us about that. It is amazing um, Deputy Director Buffer of Tadovandari Tiger Reserve and he and Pardeshi were the main instruments in putting this up. Gajendra mm Naravne. -hmm. And now we have uh, Guru Prasad. Amazing officers. And of course, um, the field director himself, Ram Gaukar, and the earlier field director, Praveen. Very, very motivated people. Mm -hmm. So you have a very apt question. So we are also, I mean, um, 
Naramne in those days also faced this problem. That how will you make people feel compassionate about wildlife? Mm. Yes. How would you make them feel safer with the jungle around them? Mm. Let's talk of the population which lives in the buffer. We are not even talking of people in Chandrapur or Nagpur, mm. which accidentally you have a stray animal coming in. But otherwise, we are talking of people who live with wildlife. How do you make them feel a little more comfortable? Mm. So in those days, Naravne started a beautiful initiative. Uh, we built a campsite at Agarzari. And now we have two, Agarzari and Madna. Mm -hmm. One of the most fascinating activities that Tadova runs is children from the schools of these buffer villages mm -hmm. are brought by the Tadova Nari buses, mm -hmm. TATR buses, bring them to this campsite. Mm -hmm. Many children stay one day. Many of them stay overnight. They stay there. Uh, we have partnered with BNHS. Bombay National History Society, BNHS runs camps for them. Mm -hmm. These camps are not about gyan. These camps are about making people fall in love with wildlife. Yes. These children are taken for a safari. Mm -hmm. You know that child when he doesn't eat at night, mommy says, Kale bache, neto, mm -hmm. So that child would never have been fascinated by wildlife. But now, with these initiatives that Tadoba runs, it's so charming. That kid, when he goes back, mm -hmm. it's also happened. I've asked one of those kids, more khaya? He said, khaya. Hiran khaya, khaya. Samar khaya, khaya. Randukar khaya, khaya. Abhi tune kya ni khaya? Sher. So, you know, they come with that background. And on the, when they're going, they are now our friends. Mm -hmm. So, answering your question, I think the entire nation has to be made to fall in love with our wife. Look at Rajasthan, look at Gujarat, yes. look at the Bishnois, yes. look at the kind of conservation one of our heroes killed. Mm -hmm. And he called himself human. Um, my organization, the Ran Mangli Foundation, we don't call ourselves human. I'll show you what we call ourselves. See if you can read this. Oh, lovely, lovely. I love this. <laughs> so, so we beautiful. claim to be being jungle. Mm -hmm. Yes. We don't make false claims. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this, if tomorrow a person like Amir Khan or Shahrukh Khan, in their movies, talks about wildlife, talks about conserving the tigers and the leopards. And that movie may fail in the box office. But people who go and watch that movie, I'm sure a lot of those people would feel passionate about it. So today, fortunately, we have Discovery Channel, we have Nat Geo, we have Animal yes. Planet, and many other channels which showcase these stories, including the media. A lot of media carries a lot of these stories also. A common Indian family has now started understanding that we have good wildlife in India. But that desire to protect it, that want to protect it, has to still come. So that happens when people come to, let's say, Taroba, Nagzira, Kana, Bandavgarh, when they come and see the wildlife. And not just the tiger, huh? because many people come only for the tiger. But when they see a jungle, they realize that, oh my God, what a dirty place we live in in a city. All garbage, smoke and dust. And look at this jungle. These animals are privileged to stay in such an environment. So, if I were asked what, to be, what is to be done to make this country a little more animal friendly, I think people should visit more of our forests, not just big tiger reserves, but also the smaller forests and take their kids along with them. You know, the kind of sanskars that were imbibed on me by my dad, not forcibly, but you know, very subtly and where I became, oh yeah, that's tiger, such a beautiful thing. Oh, that's a bird, lovely. That is the kind of 
passion or the compassion which I had towards Valdi. That needs to be imbibed into the next generations. Hmm. That is where I think thing, things will start changing for this country. So, yeah, um, I mean, through your medium, I would like to appeal to all parents to take their children to different jungles, not just Thadu and not just for the tiger. Take them to see birds. Take them to just take in lots of fresh air, which yes. we don't get in the city. Hmm. I think that will that will change our outlook towards our forests. It's wonderful. And while we are still talking about this, you know, can you talk to us about some of the myths that surround wildlife in terms of why people are afraid and why there is no reason to be? Including a snake. All animals are scared of human beings. Man on two legs is the most dangerous animal. So all these animals have told their babies. So it, keeps getting, you know, put into the heads of all the new generations. Beware of that. So I'll give you an example. Uh, we were in um, Anamalai. Anamalai is in South India, yeah. close to Coimbatore. Beautiful forest up in the hills. And we had this boy called Ganeshan, who is the local boy from the local tribe of Shuliga. And he used to stay inside the forest. And he used to come, his employment was whenever groups like us came there, mm. he would volunteer with us and he would be paid. Mm. He would accompany us into the forest, he would try and very little communication. Mm. But whatever little he would be able to tell us what it is and those kind of mm. He used to work on the camp with us till about 9.30 at night. Mm. After dinner, he would go home. 5.30 to 6, he would be the first person to come and give a wake-up call on the door. Mm -hmm. So once through an interpreter, I was asking him, aren't you scared? Yes. You don't have a cycle, you don't have a torch. How do you go back home? He says, I go running. I said, what nonsense, I go running? Mm -hmm. Through the dark jungle? Mm -hmm. He said, yeah, you can see in the jungle. I said, mm -hmm. okay. But uh, don't the animals catch you? I said, no, the animals will never catch you. They, in fact, move away. I said, what do you mean? So I said, when I go home at 9.30, 10 or whenever, I run. So when I, my steps as they, you know, thud, 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 they send vibrations way ahead of me. Mm -hmm. And those vibrations tell all the snakes and creepy crawlies to make way. And then I'm singing. Mm. I'm singing anything. Yesterday, I was singing the song that you all taught me. Mm -hmm. There's a Padma mm -hmm. song, Ging Yang Guli Guli. Mm -hmm. I sing Majaka song. Mm -hmm. And you're singing that all the way home. So I'm telling the elephants and the tigers and the leopards and the sloth bears that human is coming, move away. And he said, I've been doing that since my childhood. Mm -hmm. I'm 45 now. Mm -hmm. No animal has touched me. Mm -hmm. But accidents happen. Even Tadoba, we have accidental cases where the tigers and you know, leopards, in some cases, or sloth bears, they have attacked humans. When this two-legged animal sits down to defecate mm -hmm. a potty, mm -hmm. he is no more a human. He becomes a bandar. Mm -hmm. From that tall thing to a short sitting, squatting, becomes a bandar who is a prey. Mm -hmm. That is where the accidents happen. Sometimes the accidents also happen in agriculture fields when people are working in agriculture. To prevent accidents happening, uh, mahua season, when people go and collect mahua from the forest, mahua mm -hmm. flowers, I see eight, ten people sitting on the ground collecting mahua. Mm -hmm. And I'm aghast. I said, Boss, why don't you do one thing? Look at that bird. That bird is called a jungle babbler. Mm -hmm. When you see 10, 12 birds eating things on the ground, there are one or two birds sitting on top, you know, looking out. Is there a cat? Is there a dog? Is there a human? Yes, yes. In a moment, they spot an enemy. They give a call and all these 10, 12 birds fly up. Here, all of you are sitting down. What if a tiger was just walking by, suddenly bumps into you? Or sees a monkey-like object there. Mm -hmm. Says food. Yes. Or a sloth bear who is just walking casually 
comes face to face with you. Mm -hmm. Why can't one person stand when others are picking? Yeah. There's a no, no, he'll get less. I said, I'm not asking one person to stand the whole day. You stand for 15, 20 minutes, then that person, then that person, then that person. Mm -hmm. All of us should contribute that 10, 15 minutes. No? It will mean a lot of safety. Yeah. There's accidents that have happened in our area have happened. One is the Mahua farmer, Mahua collectors, mm -hmm. or the Tendu collectors who go into the forest. Mm -hmm. Some cases, even the cattle herders who go in, in the morning sessions, they're fine. Mm -hmm. They're walking out. But post eating the daba, they become a little you know, sedated. And they sit or they sleep. Mm -hmm. When they're sitting, that's when attacks have taken place. Mm -hmm. so some, yeah, some attacks have taken place. Some accidental attacks may, may have taken place otherwise, but I'm talking of a general maximum number of attacks, where do they take place? These are preventable, many of them. So the fear that animals kill us, why don't you ask a spotted deer, who is the most dangerous? Is it the tiger? He'll say, no, it's a human being. So the number of human beings and the number of spotted deer that have been killed by humans, number of summer deer, number of tigers, Sariska National uh, Sariska Tiger Reserve lost all its tigers to poaching. Same happened with Tanna and same happened with Namdafa. Of course, now we've introduced tigers from elsewhere mm -hmm. and we have good population now. Mm -hmm. But the number of tigers or the leopards or the different animals that have been killed and for all stupid beliefs that there are medicinal properties, so-called. Now, of course, you know, the tiger skin has no value. You cannot have a tiger skin and display it. Tomorrow morning, somebody will complain and you'll go in with you. But the tiger bones or tiger body parts is still fetch a lot of value. Sloth bear, the bile from sloth bear, which is huge amounts. Stupid beliefs. Mm -hmm. mm, animal like um, pangolin. You know, the pangolin scales yes. that they put in there, you know. Mm drives of evil spirits or something. I don't know, some rubbish. Hmm. So these kind of things are uh, irrational, mm -hmm. unscientific, and have their efficacy has never been proven. Mm -hmm. But the animals have been killed. Yes. What we need to do is, um, we need to, ed see, educate is hardly a word. I mean, ed everyone is educated about the need to save wildlife. It's not that we don't know that wildlife needs to be saved. Compassion has to be built. The love has to come in. Only when the love comes, the respect will come and the realization that protection is a must. Hmm. If there's no love, wildlife will not survive. Simple as that. That's true. So thanks to people like Bitu Segal, who works with kids, Mm -hmm. uh, Dharmendar Singh Khandal, the forest department in various states and mm -hmm. working with children. So these kind of works actually work towards the future of wildlife. Danda and Banduk will never work. Yeah. They have not worked for so many years, they will not work in future. Making people who live with the wildlife less dependent on the forest and providing them livelihoods which are non-extractive, what Tarwa is showing. Second, apart from this, ensuring that they also find uh, their basic necessities met, light, money, medical facilities, better schools. Tarwa installed e-learning in all the schools for the little kids. Of course, we need to do much more now. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is, even they can have aspirations. The villagers who stay in the 80 villages around Tadova. Mm -hmm. Let us not forget that. So if he did not have livelihood, but if he went to Chandrapur and saw me on my motorcycle, mm -hmm. it would be wrong, ethically wrong for me to tell him that you cannot buy a motorcycle because you are living in the forest. Yes. You don't have a right to a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. And if he has a right to a motorcycle and if he doesn't have the right to money, he can cut a few trees, sell them. Or if he can be party to killing an animal and sell it off. Mm -hmm. I don't think 
there is anything wrong in that because we are not providing for it. So we need to provide. We need to be providers, and that is what the forest department did in Tadu. So that is where Tadu's success story is. When all over the world we are seeing more and more species are getting threatened, are going from threatened to near extinction. In, uh, incidentally, we all talk of tiger, and around three thousand tigers are there. and people keep talking are extinct to jayenge we should know that there are less than 200 great indian bustards in this country or the planet the probability of great indian bustard going extinct is very very probable and in the next few years in our lifetimes the white backed vulture went extinct almost and next in line is the great indian bustard so i don't think these are very happy stories and especially coming from a country like india where the trees and the animals have been worshiped as gods today the same animals and the same trees are facing a problem in india i mean you know i like to tell people europeans go and preach to the world you know conserve protect preserve the entire continent europe does not have even a single big cat no tiger no leopard no puma no jaguar no lion nothing they have killed everything mm. if even if a wolf is seen in europe mm. helicopter go and gunman go and shoot it down and tell the world protect your wildlife mm. protect conserve they should not be telling all this to asians africans mm. south americans that conservation is a part of life because tiger is a god to us mm. if you go to tadova mm. and drive around in tadova you'll see uh, statues of the tiger i thought shivsena ruling tadova i said nee, there must be something else i realized there was this man who told me ha ah, wo vagoba hai aur wo vagin hai dono mm-hmm. to tiger se dikh rahe nahi nahi waise nahi a tiger had killed a man there usne vagoba And tiger had killed a woman there. That's why again, I said tiger had killed a man or man had killed a tiger. He said no, no, no. Tiger had killed a man. Mm-hmm. So tiger ne admi ko mara or admi ne putala banaya tiger ka. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this is conservation. This is tolerance. People who live next to these tigers, this is the kind of tolerance that they have. That they have made this into a deity, into a god. हमारे घर में एक चूहा आ गया वन कॉक्रोच इन आर हाउस इन दिटी यू नो वॉट आई थिंक लॉर्ड ऑफ वीमेन स्टार्टेड क्लाइमिंग चेयर एंड टेबल्स वेन दे सॉ और एट इन दाउस वी शुड नॉट टीच कॉन्जर्वेशन एंड टॉलरेंस टू दीज पीपल हु लिव इन दिलेज एंड यूरोपियन शुड नॉट बी टीचिंग एस कॉन्जर्वेशन बिकॉज इट्स अ पार्ट ऑफ आर It's in the veins, our nas nas man. Gau me abhi bhi hai. Shehar dur nikal chale. Shehro ko bhi vapis lana hai jaiye. I think uh, you know you spoke about that. It's bringing back a memory. We watched it on TV only. Uh, Meer cats. That's what they do. You know they they keep watch and then the moment they see something threatening them. So I've always been so fascinated by that. It's such a beautiful arrangement and so brilliant actually. You know. Uh, i think so much to learn from uh, them i think and uh, oh, in fact man is learning from biomimicry is the word where we keep learning from wildlife so if you've seen a f16 fighter aircraft mm-hmm. and if you look at a kingfisher bird flying you'd say the kingfisher is copying the f16 mm-hmm. that's not the way I mean, it's the other way around our designs the streamlined designs are from birds or when the rafales came from france to india they came in a v formation yes that's the same formation that the birds use while migrating absolutely or uh, the geese the bar headed geese you know the higher you go in altitudes the lesser is the air resistance that's why our aircraft even the boeing fly at about 30 35000 feet mm-hmm. incidentally 30000 is the altitude at which the geese fly mm-hmm. and the captain tells you know the 
temperature outside is minus 50 degrees. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. where the geese fly. So there's so much that we are continuously learning from the wildlife. And I think we know about 2%. We still don't know how the tree sends water all the way up to the highest branches. If you needed to send water, the kind of pumps you mm -hmm. require. Mm -hmm. And the tree does it so easily. And we still don't know the exact mechanism. There are lots of postulates, mm -hmm. but no one can confirm, tell us. Or how do the birds migrate? If yes. at Nagpur, at Gorewada Lake, if there is a particular duck coming, and if I ring it, put a ring around its leg, and keep a watch, next year, almost the same day, the bird will come back there. How does he know Gorewada? Does he have a GPS? Does he have Google Maps? I don't know what he has. But they come. Absolutely. And they go back there. Yeah. Many times, they come earlier and the chicks come later. How do they tell the chick, Hey, Gorewada, Ajana. Oh, how? But chicks come Amazing. All on their own. Huh. Amazing. In some cases, the chicks come before. Hmm. How have they been told? Kaha jana hai? So, it's okay. mind boggling. Yeah. Feel and there's so much to learn from that. Yes. So is there some kind of a like, classification that you can talk to us about in terms of wildlife so that we get to understand the term better? Wildlife would include <laughs> to a layman it is carnivore and a herbivore. Carnivore is jo mask khata hai, or herbivore jo ghas khata hai. That's the easiest. Hmm. This classification is very wide. It is chordate and non-chordate. That is with the backbone and bones mm -hmm. and without backbone and bones. Otherwise, we call it the lower animals and the higher animals. Mm -hmm. So there are various types of classification. Mm -hmm. In wildlife, we call certain animals as domestic mm -hmm. and certain animals as wild animals, wilderness animals. Out of those wild animals, mm -hmm. some animals have been domesticated like the red jungle fowl, the Ran Murga, hmm. has been domesticated as the bantam breed, hmm. the Gauran, you know, cow, uh, poultry that we have. Hmm. Interestingly, in the Northeast, uh, you know, in uh, here also in Central India, we have a, the largest animal in Maharashtra is not an elephant. It's, naturally, we don't have elephants. Of course, now we have a couple of elephants coming from Karnataka and a bunch of them coming from Chhattisgarh and from Jharkhand, they're coming into obviously. But otherwise, the largest animal is called the Indian gaur, gava. Hmm. Hmm. Wrongly called as the Indian bison. It's not a bison, it's a gaur. In Arunachal Pradesh, it's very interesting. This domestication process mm -hmm. has That's bred the gaur with the in with the cattle. They come from the same species, from the bovine species. So they can interbreed. So they have something called as Mithun. Mm -hmm. So Mithun is a cross mm -hmm. between the cow and the uh, god. Mm -hmm. And the richest family in a Arunachali ho of a village is the one with the maximum number of Mithuns. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, in the Shadi, they have to give Mithuns. They, I mean, they, well, they eat Mithun. Hmm. So all those things. So it's very interesting. So, you know, domestic and non-domestic also there is. Hmm. Interestingly, wild may you have around 3,000 to 3,500 tigers. Plus one miles. In the American homes, in people's collections, there are more tigers who have been kept in cages and personal collections. In the Chinese trade. Hmm. There are many more tigers than the Americans have, which are put in small, small cages. That's rubbish. Hmm. The animal market that they have. But anyway, so tiger, is it wild or domestic? It's wild in India. It's domestic in America. It is eaten in China. That's how you can classify wild. If it moves, it is eaten in China. I mean, why would you have bats and all sorts of things? You know, they said, no, no, uh, the virus came from bats. I said, what were the bats doing there? No, they were in the market. I said, bats in the market? 
I only knew, knew cricket bats in the market. They didn't know we eat bats. So why should you be eating bats? Yeah, it's crazy. But yeah. So if there's a young person who's very fascinated by the wildlife and this this whole sector, can he take it up as a career? That is one question. Ten years ago, the parents would be aghast. Today, we are blessed with so many families who are sending not only their sons. In fact, Pagmaan had so many girls, like I mentioned, Pallavi Gaspar or Parveen Sheikh, hmm, Pooja. Ah, and there's so many, I mean, I could rattle away names of girls who are contributing to conservation. And the number of boys is obviously much more, but there are so many families who are letting their girls out to follow their heart's calling. And that is what Pagmaks did. Hmm. Pagmaks only showed them that this was the route. Hmm. And they did it all on themselves. The two sisters, Pooja Rathod and Shraddha Rathod, hmm. come from Marwari background. But today they are doing some amazing work for conservation. So, you know, Pooja Pawar, there's this girl, hmm, comes from a very basic background, but today she works with e-birds, the e-bird portrait. And one of the biggest contributions that Pooja has done to Pagmaks has been, uh, I'm sorry, to Tadoba has been that she trained our housewives in the villages mm -hmm. to become bird watchers. And today these ladies who are till yesterday, ah, they can identify 200 plus birds and they take people for birding and as if that was not enough Guru Prasad, the deputy director got them to take tourists for night safaris so one girl accompanies the tourists for night safaris Tarubha has shown Tarubha is an equal opportunity employer and is also a gender conscious employer, it gives opportunities to everyone so, I'm saying from a village girl to a career girl making her, I mean, studying for her PhD, to boys wanting to be naturalists and resorts, mm -hmm. a huge number of opportunities coming up. In fact, the Tadovandari Tiger Reserve mm -hmm. has put up, if you went to say Tadova, my Tadova, sorry, my Tadova dot org, there is internship opportunities. So if you're passionate about wildlife and you are still not confident whether I will fit or not fit, mm -hmm. take up an internship with Taru. And then decide for yourself whether you fit or not. So these are kind of opportunities that are available in so many places. Too. And I'll tell you something, you can make big money being in a BPO company where your body clock goes for a toss because sometimes you work night shift, sometimes you work day shift. It's a horrible place to work. Or you work in an office with piles and piles of files. But to a wildlifer, every day is a new day. To um, a naturalist, to a researcher, every day is a fascinating new day. So through your medium, I would love to appeal to people to send their children to search out opportunity but 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 foundations have to be clear they are life science or you know, botany zoology and their graduation i think they should first take care of that part because later in life you know you are not even a graduate but very good at field work and somebody with graduation but no field knowledge can overtake you in the career so at least get your foundations right and then you join any of these opportunities. Lots of opportunities and terrific um, work environment, if I may think. It was wonderful talking. There are no to Monday blues. Yeah, Sorry? that's true. Yes, I, I think every day would be a delightful one, you know. If, actually, just being with nature itself is such a blessing. So I'm sure it's a very wonderful experience. Uh, before we conclude this conversation, is there a message that you have for the regular citizen of this country? Uh, 
in terms of you know what what can we do for the wildlife our villagers as i mentioned realized that tomorrow if they cut the jungle tigers won't be there tourists won't come livelihood livelihoods won't be there i think it is high time that we realized if the forests go forget employment forget beautiful jungles we will not be left with water so tadoba is a pani denara jungle it's a forest that gives water to chandrapur if there were no tadoba there would be no thermal power station in chandrapur maharashtra wouldn't have got such a major if you are in pune bombay in western maharashtra you are not aware that your electricity is being generated next to tadoba from chandrapur forest like chandrapur forest like tadoba i mean forest like tadoba have to remain for maharashtra and for india and for the planet to survive it is no more a luxury it is a bare necessity our villagers have understood it's high time our urban population also understands that we cannot cannot do away with our forests and the beautiful people who live in them that was a burden hmm. but he never forced me into birding but i used to keep watching hmm. sometimes kya kare kuch to chidiya bidiya many times when we are in the forest and uh, we are trained with our binoculars and some you know the moment your gypsy halts all the other gypsies want to come and stop next to tiger dikh raha hai kya nahi chidiya dekh rahe pagle kahi chidiya dekhne ruk jate hain yeah that is the kind of attitude but my dad uh, i mean um, he used to have a book old book by dr salim ali and in fact if you just frame into what is behind me i don't smoke i don't drink but uh, this and also this closed one they are all full of books and most number of books are on birds wonderful uh, so that is what my dad gave in genes into me what um, there is another friend of mine kiran who is now in nagzira to many of us kiran was our guru in birding we saw him listen to birds and then we took it up ourselves so many of us are doing this now when you see a bird many of these birds have very difficult names mm -hmm. ruby throated sub species of the black headed yellow bulbul scary oh my god yes, so how do you remember all these names so many scary names so then i said you have to make it more interesting if you can put words into the bird calls Mm -hmm. and then tell the people who are coming with you see the pretty city i'll beat you well the spotted babbler mm -hmm. so it how does it sound mm -hmm. beat you mm -hmm. or the going into the jungle mm -hmm. and you're scared share cheetah hathi bhalu koi to jump karega and suddenly you hear this call Lion, clear. Mm. And so don't 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 be scared. Keep walking. Lion, clear. <laughs> There are these cuckoos, and these cuckoos, um, uh, you know, they they call up at any time of night. Mm. So in fact, my friends who knew I was into birding would come and tell me, "Your beautiful birds, night ko two baje chillate." I say, "Ah, kal batamu unko mat chilla." But quails and cuckoos that you are aware of, you know, they can scream. So, imagine um, there's this bird called papiha. In MP, it mm. calls it. No, my papiha, where? My papiha, where? No. Or to a Maharashtrian shakeri farmer, it says, "Paus ala, per hmm? teva, start sowing." So he's telling a farmer that the rains are coming. Start sowing. Mm. But imagine a Britisher who is working on one of our road projects. Let's say in central India, temperature in May must have been forty-seven degrees centigrade, terribly hot. Comes back to the rest house. The water is hot. He can't even take a good, you no know, good bath. I'm talking of nineteen twenties, nineteen thirties. No AC, no fan, nothing. Mm -hmm. 
tries to sleep, there are mosquitoes who are singing around his ear. Finally, at 12 o'clock, gets his khati up, puts it under the mango tree, falls asleep. One o'clock, <coughs> the call, the call and it goes up in crescendo. Hmm. So this call, <coughs> the British has called it brain fever. Oh. Fever data. Brain fever. Or there's one which says <coughs> ka 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 ku. Ka 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 ku. Mm -hmm. or if you are from Uttaranchal, mm -hmm. it talks of a fruit which you know ripens, but the bird says kafal pako, kafal pako, par main nahi chakho, main nahi chakho, kafal pako, main nahi chakho. Kafal is ripe, but I've not tasted it yet. Oh, lovely. Mm -hmm. Or if you've been into the area where they make copper vessels, the call, the sound is exactly like this. So this is a bird called barbet or the coppersmith and it's the same sound that a coppersmith makes when he's making a copper vessel. So and I'll give you one last one. We have an eagle and let's say 200 feet, 200 meters away if the eagle is sitting on a tree and if you're reading a newspaper here, the eagle can read the headlines of the paper from there. That is the kind of eyesight. So I like to tell all those little kids who come on camps, if I were an eagle, I would have passed all my exams with flying colors. You said, how? I said, the first answer I would copy from that corner. Write down the answer. Next question I could copy from that corner. The third answer I would have twisted my neck 270 degrees that an eagle can do and copy from that corner. And then from that corner. Today, the situation is where a Samne Waleke notebook me Kali I can't read. That's why I feel it's because I'm not an eagle. So, this bird from that 2000 feet altitude can see a small snake, can see a small hare, rabbit, baby, hare, or can see a yeah, small prey and then swoop down, pull its wings back, swoop down, and come and catch the prey from that height. Yes. So I was with very little kids and I was, I said, I'm going to call out like the eagle. You have to tell me what does it say? Hmm. So the call is like this. So one kid puts up his hand. Yeah, tell me. Beware, here I come. Beware. Here I come. I say, appropriate. If that bird has not done that, I'm going to tell him to do this now. <laughs> Call up like, beware, here I come. So, yeah, I mean, bird calls are very, very interesting. Uh, there are loads and loads of these bird calls. I mean, it's uh, endless. I think if people like you were to interact more with kids, you know, they would really fall in love with. And it's a good idea to focus on the kids because they are going to do things in the future. So, uh, it was brilliant, amazing, wonderful, and uh, so fascinating. So <laughs> yeah. How many can you do? How many calls can you imitate? 30, 30 three zero. Wow. But um, but I've learned to identify most of the birds by their calls mm -hmm. because the Indian forests are not like Africa, which are open forests. So Indian forests, the birds are all in there, you know, you know, in the foliage, in the bush, in the and you need to identify them just by their calls, the sounds that they make. Mm -hmm. Discover your wild side. Everyone has a jungle in them or her. Mm -hmm. um, if if it permits you, they can write to me at Ran Mangli Foundation at gmail.com. There are lots of opportunities for youngsters to come and work on field. And explore the wild side. Wilderness is a place. Let them intern. Hmm. Let them be volunteers. Let them intern. I mean, we were all interns. We were all volunteers with the 
worldwide fund for nature once upon a time. That's that's how we are here today. So there are no shortcuts. You have to go through the tough ride. Mm -hmm. By being an intern, by working with such communities, with wildlife, will give you an experience which might make you a career naturalist or a career, career wildlifer or a career in forest department. And one message, if I can give through your medium, to all the other states, most of the other states, sorry, most of the other states other than Maharashtra, come to Tadova, come to Maharashtra, learn from Maharashtra as example, where we've learned to work with our communities and the communities are equal partners in our conservation. Yes. And that I think is the biggest takeaway. So I think this conversation is going to motivate all of us to be a little more jungly maybe in terms of learning from them as well as, you know, learning about them. Uh, great pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for being on Ek Sambad. And uh, as someone who cares so much for the wildlife, I think thank you from us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.